Hello and welcome, let's take a look what some popular fantasy and horror characters would look like if an AI created them. His limbs were in proportion, and I had selected his features as beautiful. Beautiful. Great God. His yellow skin scarcely covered the work of muscles and arteries beneath, his hair was of a lustrous black, and flowing, his teeth of a pearly whiteness, but these luxuriances only formed a more horrid contrast with his wiry eyes, that seemed almost of the same color as the dumb white sockets in which they were set, his shriveled complexion and straight black lips. The tall, old man, clean-shaven save for a long white mustache, and clad in black from head to foot, without a single speck of color about him anywhere, his face was a strong, a very strong aquiline, with high bridge of the thin nose and peculiarly arched nostrils, with lofty domed forehead, and hair growing scantily round the temples but profusely elsewhere. His eyebrows were very massive, almost meeting over the nose, and with bushy hair that seemed to curl in its own profusion. The mouth, so far as I could see it under the heavy mustache, was fixed and rather cruel looking, with peculiarly sharp white teeth, these protruded over the lips, whose remarkable ruddiness showed astonishing vitality in a man of his years. For the rest, his ears were pale, and at the tops extremely pointed, the chin was broad and strong, and the cheeks firm though thin. The general effect was one of extraordinary power. Around 2000 years ago the Roman poet Ovid first mentioned the monster Medusa in his poem Metamorphoses. Medusa once had charms, to look upon her was to fall in love with her. But she was vain, and because she was beautiful, she boasted endlessly and flaunted herself. She was punished for this by Minerva, her charms were changed into a hideousness that could not be surpassed, and the hair which had been her glory was changed to repulsive snakes. Kraken has been described in multiple different literature works, but in this video we will focus on the description of Jules Verne, in his popular book 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. The monster appeared to have been not only a formidable creature, but a kind of cyclops, if one could judge from a single enormous eye, placed in the middle of its forehead, it was a giant mollusk, a squid of enormous dimensions, belonging to the most formidable of the two cephalopod orders, its arms were covered with suckers, and its eight tentacles, which it could lengthen or contract at will, made it a fearsome opponent. Although Tolkien wasn't the first author to describe a dragon, the dragon smog from the Hobbit is certainly one of the most famous ones. He was a most specially greedy, strong and wicked worm, and he had a great desire for gold and silver, and precious stones, and all the other treasures that he had hoarded in his underground lair. He was huge, immense, the like of which had never been seen before by dwarf or man. He was larger far than any giant in human legend, and his fire was so hot that he could melt the hardest metal. His scales were like iron, his claws like steel, and his great red eyes glowed with a baleful light. The clown was wearing a baggy silk suit with great big red buttons. His cheeks were chubby and his face was plump and pleasant. A clown's face. There was no jolly smile on it, however. Instead, there was a suggestion of slyness and of wickedness. Above the clown's forehead, printed in glittery gold letters, were the words, The Dancing Clown. This initial description of Pennywise is designed to be somewhat disarming, with his chubby cheeks and pleasant expression appearing harmless at first glance. However, there are hints even in this passage that something is not quite right about the clown, from the slyness in his expression to the glittery lettering on his forehead. As the book progresses, Pennywise's appearance becomes increasingly grotesque and monstrous, reflecting the true horror lurking beneath his clownish facade. Carrie was a small girl, slender, with unremarkable features. She was pretty enough, but not in a way that would get her into the in-group at school. Her eyes were light, and they were often full of tears that spilled over and ran down her cheeks in two steady rivulets. Her hair was a dull, lifeless brown, and it hung down around her shoulders in length strands. She usually dressed in faded blouses and blue jeans, clothes that might have been trendy six or seven years ago but were now just sad. As the story progresses and Carrie becomes more powerful, her appearance changes as well, with her hair becoming more vibrant and her features more intense. The novella The Hellbound Heart inspired the cult classic horror movie Hellraiser and this is the description of the character Pinhead, one of the Cenobites who became the face of the Hellraiser franchise. Their heads were raw and skull-like, 
with tight lips and oversized eyes sunken deep in the sockets. The flesh around their heads was pulled tight as if it had been stretched over bone, and through the taut skin ran thin white scars. Their black leather clothing was studded with tiny gold ornaments that glinted in the candlelight, and from their belts hung intricate instruments that looked like surgical tools from a nightmare. Norman Bates was a thin, long-nosed, and somewhat effeminate young man in his late twenties. His eyes were dark and guarded, and there was an aloof quality about his manner. He had a nervous, high-pitched laugh that grated on the nerves, and his movements were quick and jerky. Later in the book, Norman's appearance is further described as skeletal and bird-like, with thin hair combed straight back and a small, neat mustache. These physical attributes are intended to contribute to Norman's overall creepy and unsettling demeanor. He was a small, elegant man in his late fifties, with slick back silver hair and pale blue eyes. Dr. Lecter's hands were small and delicate, and on his left hand, he wore a large signet ring with a red stone. He was dressed in a light gray three-piece suit, a pale lavender shirt, and a muted paisley tie. He looked like a European businessman, except for his eyes, which were very alert and glinted with a cold intelligence. This initial description of Hannibal Lecter creates a sense of his refinement and sophistication, as well as his intelligence and attention to detail. The mention of his ring and clothing choices also suggest a certain level of wealth and taste. However, there is also an underlying sense of danger and unpredictability in his cold, alert eyes. She was a small girl, maybe only about 160 centimeters tall. She wore a thin, white cotton dress and had long, black hair that hung down to her waist. Her hair was wet and matted and clung to her face. Her face was expressionless and her skin was as white as the dress she was wearing. She looked like a living corpse. This description emphasizes Sadako's eerie, otherworldly appearance, with her wet hair and blank expression lending her a particularly unsettling air. Throughout the book, her appearance is often contrasted with that of more normal, human characters, further highlighting her supernatural nature. He is not easy to describe. There is something wrong with his appearance, something displeasing, something downright detestable. I never saw a man I so disliked, and yet I scarce know why. He must be deformed somewhere, he gives a strong feeling of deformity, although I couldn't specify the point. He's an extraordinary looking man, and yet I really can name nothing out of the way. No, sir, I can make no hand of it, I can't describe him. And it's not one of memory, for I declare I can see him this moment. This passage is notable for the sense of revulsion and unease that it conveys, as well as for the way in which the speaker struggles to put into words exactly what it is about Mr. Hyde's appearance that is so unsettling. The idea that Hyde is somehow deformed, but that this deformity is difficult to pinpoint, contributes to the sense that there is something fundamentally wrong with the man. As the book progresses, Hyde's appearance becomes more and more monstrous, reflecting the true horror of his actions. The first appearance of mermaids in literature can be traced back to ancient myths and legends, which often depicted them as alluring and beautiful but also dangerous and unpredictable creatures. However, if we're looking for a direct quote from a specific work of literature, one example could be from Hans Christian Andersen's The Little Mermaid, which was first published in 1837. Far out in the ocean, where the water is as blue as the prettiest cornflower, and as clear as crystal, it is very, very deep, so deep, indeed, that no cable could fathom it, many church steeples, piled one upon another, would not reach from the ground beneath to the surface of the water above. There dwell the sea king and his subjects. We must not imagine that there is nothing at the bottom of the sea but bare yellow sand. No, indeed, the most singular flowers and plants grow there, the leaves and stems of which are so pliant that the slightest agitation of the water causes them to stir as if they had life. Fishes, both large and small, glide between the branches, as birds fly among the trees here upon land. In the deepest spot of all, stands the castle of the Sea King. Its walls are built of coral, and the long, gothic windows are of the clearest amber. The roof is formed of shells, that open and close as the water flows over them. Their appearance is very beautiful, for in each lies a glittering pearl, which would be fit for the diadem of a queen. 
While this passage doesn't describe the mermaids themselves in detail, it does establish the vivid, otherworldly setting in which they live, which is typical of many early depictions of mermaids in literature. One of the earliest descriptions of a cyclops can be found in Homer's The Odyssey, which was written around the 8th century BCE. The cyclops in the Odyssey is named Polyphemus, and he is described in detail in Book 9 of the epic poem. We soon reached his cave, but he was out shepherding, so we went inside and took stock of all that we could see. His cheese racks were loaded with cheeses, and he had more lambs and kids than his pens could hold. They were kept in separate flocks, first there were the augets, then the oldest of the younger lambs and lastly the very young ones all kept apart from one another, as for his dairy. All the vessels, bowls, and milk pails into which he milked, were swimming with whey. When they saw all this, my men begged me to let them first steal some cheeses, and make off with them to the ship, they would then return, drive down the lambs and kids, put them on board and sail away with them. It would have been indeed better if we had done so but I would not listen to them, for I wanted to see the owner himself, in the hope that he might give me a present. When, however, we saw him my heart failed me, for his body was so huge that it reminded me of nothing on earth but a mountain peak in size and shape. He was Cyclops, and had one eye, his brow was knit, and his nose was like the peak of a mountain. The Loch Ness Monster, also known as Nessie, is a legendary creature said to inhabit Loch Ness in Scotland. The first recorded sighting of Nessie dates back to 565 AD. But the modern idea of a large aquatic creature in Loch Ness was popularized in the early 20th century. The first detailed description of the Loch Ness Monster's appearance in modern literature can be found in the book The Loch Ness Monster and Others by Maurice Burton, published in 1961. Here is a direct quote from that book. The creature appeared to be a monster with a long, tapering neck, a small head, and two small, hump-like features on its back. It was estimated to be about 40 feet long, with a body the diameter of an oil drum. This description has since become the iconic image of Nessie that is widely recognized today. However, it's important to note that there are many different descriptions and variations of Nessie's appearance in popular culture and folklore. The unicorn, a mythical creature associated with purity, grace, and healing, has appeared in various mythologies and ancient cultures throughout history. The earliest known description of a unicorn's appearance in literature can be found in the ancient Greek accounts of the natural historian Tetius, who wrote about the creatures he encountered during his travels to India in the 4th century BCE. There are in India certain wild asses which are as large as horses, and even larger. Their bodies are white, their heads dark red, and their eyes dark blue. They have a horn on the forehead which is about a foot and a half in length. The base of this horn, for some two hands breadth above the brow, is pure white, the upper part is sharp and of a vivid crimson, and the middle portion is black. Those who drink out of these horns, made into drinking vessels, are not subject, they say, to convulsions or to the sacred disease. While this passage does not use the term unicorn, it is widely believed to be the earliest description of the creature that would later become known as the unicorn. The description emphasizes the creature's size, coloration, and most notably, its single horn, which is depicted as a striking and valuable feature. Subsequent depictions of the unicorn in literature and art have expanded upon its appearance and symbolism. Leprechauns are mythical creatures from Irish folklore, typically depicted as small, mischievous beings who guard pots of gold. The earliest known written account of a leprechaun's appearance can be found in the 8th century Irish tale The Adventure of Fergus MacLeddy, although the leprechaun in this story is not explicitly referred to as such. However, the description of the character matches later depictions of leprechauns. Here is a direct quote from the story that describes the character's appearance. The little creature was not much higher than a man's knee, his face was wrinkled and old, and he wore a coat and hat, both of green. This passage describes a small, elderly creature wearing a green coat and hat. This description has become the traditional depiction of leprechauns in subsequent Irish folklore and popular culture. In Hull Dolls the BFG, the big friendly giant is described as follows. The BFG was twice as tall as an ordinary man. He had a face that looked like it was squashed in and stretched out, and it was not a face that anyone could ever forget. 
It was also a face that was full of kindness and wisdom, and his eyes were so wonderfully bright that they could light up a room if he opened them wide. His nose was very large and his ears were like windmills, and when he smiled, it was like watching the sun coming up. This passage from the book provides a vivid and memorable description of the BFG's physical appearance. He is much taller than a normal human, with a unique and somewhat comical facial structure that still manages to convey kindness and intelligence. The imagery of his large nose and windmill-like ears adds to the whimsical nature of the character, while his bright, smiling eyes create a sense of warmth and compassion. In Greek mythology, Pegasus is described as a majestic winged horse. While there is no one specific first description of Pegasus in literature, the general image of the creature is widely depicted and recognized. One famous description of Pegasus comes from the Greek poet Hesiod in his work Theogony, written in the 8th or 7th century BCE. And she, Echidna, conceived and bare a son, to Poseidon, a horse of adamant whose hoof was as a diamond, and this horse he gave to his own son to be ridden. And she brought forth yet a second, a winged horse, which Argifontes, Hermes, stole, and having yoked him to his own chariot, gave him to the son of Leto, Apollon, Pegasus, Pegasus, swift as the wind, whom the goddess bore, and flew away leaving the earth, rejoicing in her swift pinions. This passage describes Pegasus as a winged horse, born from the blood of Medusa and sired by Poseidon, with a hoof made of diamond. The image of Pegasus as a magnificent winged creature has since become an enduring symbol of imagination and fantasy. Like and subscribe.